Isn't it a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian? Yes. Not because it's getting easier, but because it's getting harder. You know what that means? The harvest is ripe and plenty for all of us. We're surrounded, we're outnumbered, we're outfinanced, and there's surrender within the church ranks. What an opportunity we have. <laughs> so tonight, critical thinking skills that disarm evolutionists. I'm going to give you some tools when you walk out of here tonight, you can immediately use these. Because there are some things in here you will remember. Got how I said that? It's not you should, you will. You do not leave here tonight through those doors unless you know some of these questions. However, if you don't know one, I'll let you substitute 20 push-ups for each one you don't know. <laughs> I believe push-ups are the cure for everything. Well, let's start. Evolution. Biology textbook. Today, nearly all biologists acknowledge that evolution is a fact. National Academy of Sciences. Is evolution a theory or a fact? It is both. This is what our students are up against. You know what? They don't know how to defend against it. If parents don't know how to defend against this, then you're probably going to lose your children. Because about over 60% are leaving the church today because they don't trust the Bible anymore. We're going to challenge that Goliath. We're going to be like David. We're going to challenge that Goliath, and we're going to be victorious. Because we already know we won the war in the end. We win, don't we? We're just doing mop-up operations now, saying, put down your arms, surrender, and come over to Jesus Christ. I tend to speak warfare a lot. <laughs> Let's talk about tactics. Uh, how many like tactics? I like strategy, I like tactics, and I'm well-trained in covert operations, and I use those techniques. Bluffing. This is what happens in the education system. We all know over millions of years, that's a bluffing statement, Grades, only evolution answers are allowed, nothing else is allowed. Some of their intimidation techniques they use against our youth. Discredit the Bible and creation. Discredit anyone who does not believe in evolution. And then establish the illusion of authority and facts. That's what our youth are up against. So let's talk about this critical thinking method. The typical method is when somebody present some evidence for evolution, you try and counter with evidence. That's what we're going to do here tonight. We're not going to do that here tonight. We're going to focus on their words. Focus on the statement they made and then hold them, hold them accountable for their statement. How many here like to be on the defense all the time? Now, if you've got a football team and all you have is a defense on the field, no offense, what's the best you can ever do? Tie. Most time you're going to lose. That's where Christians usually are. We're confronted with challenges and questions about evolution, and we're on the defense. Tonight, we're going to show you how to turn it around and be on the offense. You know why? Because I like to win. I like to win so much you play those games with the hourglass. When you're not looking, I'm going tap, 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 tap. <laughs> Anybody here? Who are my computer people here? Okay, I don't count games as computers. I don't play games with computers, but I can get the highest score. You don't want me near your computer. <laughs> I learned to break encryption codes, find out what the scores are, break the encryption code, put my name and a score in there, and never had to take the time to play and always have the highest score. <coughs> it's not cheating if you don't get caught, isn't it? <coughs> no, that's not biblical. <laughs> you can erase that from the tape. <coughs> okay, let's start here. Three critical thinking questions. When I train junior hires and above, this is one of my main talks. Because I want to arm them, <clears throat> arm them there. Three critical thinking questions. When you're confronted with evolution, how do you know that's true? That's question number one. How do you know it's true? Question number two. Has it ever been observed? That first question is going to stop them in their tracks, and they're going to have to say where they got their information from. You know, a lot of times it's the Internet. How many trust the Internet? <clears throat> yes. So how do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? <clears throat> I'm going to show you how easy this is. Who here can give me all three of them? Anybody give me all three of those? <clears throat> okay, go ahead. <clears throat> how do you know it's true? Good. Has it ever been observed? Are you making it? Very good. Now, how many of you were assuming you weren't allowed to look? <laughs> You're making assumptions already. <laughs> how do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? I'm going to show you a tactic because I want people using these. When I'm with the junior hires and high schools, <clears throat> I get three volunteers right away. 
I never have a problem getting volunteers. <clears throat> so I need three volunteers here. Uh, thank you. You, you, you moved. You're, you'll be number one. You'll be number two. And who's going to be my number three? Uh, you want to be number three? I saw you moving. Yes. See, that's why I never run out of volunteers. If you move, you volunteer. That's military. <clears throat> so we have a number one, number two, and number three. So anytime I say number one, what are you going to say? How do you know it's true? And if I say number two? Has it ever been observed? And if I say three? Are you making any assumptions? Okay, let's try it and see how well we're doing. Number one. How do you know it's true? Number two. Has it ever been observed? And number three. Are you making any assumptions? Okay. You see, what I'm doing here is called disguised form of repetition. You're going to hear this 15 to 20 times before we finish, and you're going to have it up here. Rather than me say it all the time, I don't have to say it all the time now. You're going to say it. I know at least three people will know one at the end of this session. <coughs> <laughs> so let's practice using this. <coughs> Here's a statement from a textbook. Life originated in a pool of chemicals about 3.7 billion years ago. Number one, how do, you know it's true? how do they know that's true? And number two, Has it ever been did, was anybody there those alleged three billion years ago to see this happen? So it hadn't been observed. And then number three, Are you any assumptions? the whole thing's an assumption, isn't it? But yet, it's being passed off as a fact. Train our students to ask these questions. <clears throat> Here's another one from a biology textbook. <clears throat> Scientists do know that about 200 to 300 million years after Earth cooled enough to carry liquid water, cells similar to the modern bacteria are common. Number one, how do they know that's true? Number two, anybody there these two to 300 million years ago? Nobody's that old. And number three, right, the whole thing's assumptions, isn't it? But it's being passed. Look at how it's, they, they do know. How do they know that? They don't. See, this is what our youth are up against, and they can't defend this. So three critical thinking questions. How do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? You make any assumptions? Now let's go to the power question. Power question. Show me any observational evidence for evolution that does not require me to use faith. What are we demanding? Observational. If you can't show me observational, it's a faith issue. Now, there's tactics I'm using here, how the brain works. I only do three at a time. We're going to have another one in there. But I only do three at a time. Get that one down a little bit. Why? Because the brain works well with threes. Put four in there, and all of a sudden, clutter comes in. Just how the mind works. So it's understanding how people educate, get educated, how they learn in the brain, something about that. <clears throat> but on this one, I get a number four. Who's my number four? Did somebody, did you just move? <laughs> yes, okay, you'll be number four. All you have to remember is the two key words, observational and faith. See, it's easy to get volunteers, isn't it? <laughs> observational faith. So number one. How do you know it's true? Good, number two. Has it ever been observed? And number three. Are you making any assumptions? And number four. Observational faith. Faith, see? Okay, we got that down. Let's try this one. Life must be on other planets. It's arrogant to believe we are the only life in the universe. <clears throat> Show me any observational evidence for life anywhere else in this universe that does not require me to use faith. Can they do that? No. We can't even find intelligent life on some places in this planet, and one of, <laughs> such as Washington, D.C. <clears throat> See, that's how we counter these statements. We're not arrogant. They're presenting what? A belief system here, not science. So we need to be able to turn this thing around. Rather than trying to answer all these questions about biology and chemistry, we just turn it around and put them on the defense. Hold them accountable for their statements. Here's another one. Over millions of years, mutations added new genetic information, allowing for all the diversity of life we see today. Okay. Show me any observational evidence for where that vast amount of information in our DNA came from that does not require me to use faith. Can they do that? No. no. The only answer they can give is this. Over millions of years and mutations. Did anybody ever observe millions of years? See, millions of years, what it means, folks, is this. We don't have the observable evidence, just trust me. That's what it's really saying. It's a bluff. Don't fall for it. And you know what? We have many Christian leaders falling for it and assuming they have to put millions of years in the Bible somewhere. Isn't that sad how weak our theology is with our leaders? 
We're out to change that. I'm going to tell you some of the things at the end, what we're doing in Boise. Two and a half years I moved there, set the goal. We're taking Boise for Jesus Christ, the whole place. I don't like little things. We're taking the whole thing. And I laid out a strategy how we're going to do this. And we're getting there. We're doing some things that are leading right now. So we have our first pop quiz. Oh, Mike, you're probably saying, why did I come tonight? He's picking on us. <laughs> and a pop quiz, um, I have pretty high standards. Not as high as God. He demands perfection. Mine are pretty close because you get 100 percent or you fail. And there's and there's there's a, something happens if you fail my quizzes. You know what it is? Push-ups. <laughs> yes. When I was at Microsoft, I trained all the software engineers on operating system, internal architecture, queuing theory, how to security systems, how to break security systems, all those kind of things. I trained them on. If they were late for a break. That door closed. It was locked. The only one way they could get in: get on the deck push-ups. <laughs> I had fun. <laughs> but pop quiz, here we go. Who can fill those words in? Observational. Observational. Faith. 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 Very good. Okay. Who's got number one? Somebody on this side, give me number one. I'm going to see how well you've been as a teacher here. How do you know it's true? How do you know it's true? Very good. Somebody over here, number two. Oh, no, we'll do number two over here. Has it ever been observed? And over here, some, number three. Are you making any assumptions? Very good, very good. See, it's starting to sink in just a little bit now, isn't it? And that's how you do it. When I do an hour presentation, there's only two or three things I want people to remember, because you're not going to remember everything I say. But this is one of them. I want to arm them right away with something they can start using. OK, words have meaning. How to read between the lines, how to recognize the bluff, Anybody, anybody remember taking English class? <clears throat> I'm going to bring back bad memories now, right? Anybody have to diagram sentences? Yeah. It's the best way to learn the English language. It just happens to be very painful. <laughs> I'm going to show you something they didn't teach you in the English language. We learn all about verbs and adverbs and adjectives and nouns, but did they ever teach you about fuzzy words and magic words? <clears throat> yes. You, so you got gypped there. <clears throat> Fuzzy words and magic words. What are fuzzy words? We believe, we think, must have, could have, might have, our opinion is, we guess over millions of years. Those are all fuzzy words. What does it mean? They don't have the observable evidence when they're used. Now, it's not wrong to use these words, but you must understand what they mean. You know where I see these words used? Textbooks. <laughs> Let's try a few here. <clears throat> Here's a life science textbook for seventh grade. Paleontologists think that Archaeopteryx and today's birds descended from some kind of a reptile, possibly a dinosaur. Let's find the fuzzy words. Think that. That's the best thing to do. We can only think this. How about some kind of? They're not even sure. And here's your scientific term, possibly. What do they know? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, isn't this great? When I do this for teens, they can't wait to get a hold of newspapers and other books. They're looking for these things all the time now. USA Today, Christian magazine, or, or newspaper, <clears throat> not hardly. There are likely tens of billions of Earth-like planets in our Milky Way galaxy. In fact, the nearest Earth-like planet may be only 12 light years away. And with a universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies, our entire universe must contain billions of Earth-like planets. There are likely, they're not sure. In fact, maybe, does that sound contradicting there? <laughs> must contain. Pretty fuzzy, isn't it? They really don't know, do they? <clears throat> Here's from the Perot Museum in Texas. It didn't, it was, it's only been there several years, but you go through there, you get all kinds of ammunition. Experiments with model protocells show how early life could have begun evolving. Protocells must grow quickly and reproduce most often when they contain genetic material that can copy itself. These protocells outcompete others. Let's start right there. What in the world is a protocell? And notice they put the word model in front of it. That means it doesn't exist. All they have is a model. There's no such thing as a protocell, something that's on its way to becoming a cell. There's no such thing. But this is in the museum. People go by and, wow, look at that. It's only a model, something we can, not living. Yes. Our life could have begun evolving. What does that tell you? They don't even know what happened back then. And how about this part? 
these protocells outcompete others? Well, if they never existed, how can they outcompete anything? <laughs> this whole thing has no science in it whatsoever. See, you don't even have to answer questions anymore. You just pull this stuff apart, and they don't have anything. Now, Joseph Silk, he's an astronomer, pretty good astronomer. He's an evolutionist, wrote a book called The Big Bang, went through his book. He's got some interesting things, but he's an evolutionist, and he's got a lot of wild things in there, too. Now, I'm going to show you a paragraph he wrote in his book, and it's all about how galaxies form. Let me read this and see if you understand what he is talking about. Imagine that infinitesimal fluctuations in density were present in the early universe. The expansion of the universe must have exerted a stabilizing influence on such irregularities. The expanding universe has the effect of greatly impeding what otherwise might have been catastrophic forces. Nevertheless, the process of growth of fluctuations went on for a very long time. How many understood that? <laughs> Where's the first fuzzy word? Imagine. What does that tell you about the whole paragraph now? <laughs> Don't even have to go any further, do you? It has nothing to do with science, his imagination. Might, must have, might have been, went on for a very long time. Nobody was there for a very long time. There's no science in this statement at all. It's just his imagination. You see, we train our students to do this. We can diffuse an awful lot of those who are losing faith in God's word. Now let's go to magic words. Appeared, emerged, arose, gave rise to, was on the way to becoming, burst onto the scene, evolved itself, and was making a transition too. These all talk about how something happened without telling you how it could have happened. Evo Devo, that stands for Evolutionary Development, proposes that genes involved in calming together flesh and bone during early growth were repurposed to develop new structures throughout evolution's history by combining their functions in new ways. Here's the magic word. Might I give you a homework assignment tonight? Boy, we got pop quizzes, you're picking on us, and I'm giving you homework. Wow, what a session. <laughs> Welcome to the Marine Corps. <laughs> I'm, this is a homework assignment. Tonight, when you go home, I want you to repurpose yourself into a new creature. How do you do that? It's all magic. I read through the whole article, and they just assume evolution's true. I want to see how it could have happened. And the only answer they always give, come back with mutations and natural selection. Folks, mutations aren't going to do it. And natural selection really doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, folks. Nothing ever gets selected. It's all pre-programmed information by our creator God. Let's stop giving the glory to mankind and something doesn't exist, natural selection. And give the glory to God who put all the information in our DNA. Around 230 million years ago, during the Triassic period, a new type of reptile emerged on the scene. Dinosaurs would rule the land for 160 million years. New type of reptile emerged. I'd like to know how that happened. No reference in that article. But hundreds or thousands and thousands of people go through that museum every month reading this. Think, wow, these people are smart. In order to survive, living things have evolved sensory systems that are adapted to their specific environments and needs. In addition to seeing, hearing, touching, and smelling, organisms have evolved a fascinating range of ways to sense their environment. Some create pictures with sound, others detect heat or navigate with electricity. Living things have evolved sensory systems. Does anybody here have a sensory system? If you heard me, you do. <laughs> it's called your ears, your eyes, and things like that. You know, sensory systems are extremely complex systems. Let's just take our ear for a moment. There's three major parts to the ear. Anybody remember them? Outer, middle, and inner. <laughs> You're probably trying to think something big. No, it's, that's what it is, outer, middle, and inner. Now, what does the outer part of the ear do? It captures these sine waves that I'm talking about. And the outer part of the ear captures those. What does the middle part do? Well, that's where your eardrum is, and it amplifies the sound. That's where your two smallest bones in the body are, too. And you have your tiny little hairs and things getting close to there. That's why you want to keep your finger out of there, because you lose your balance after a while. But what does the inner part do? Something amazing. It converts those sound waves into electrical pulses and sends them to the brain. That is a highly complex mechanism there. How did that evolve? There's no mention how that could have happened. Nothing. 
No, I just thought this whole last part. Organisms have evolved fasting in range of ways to sense their environment. That's pretty incredible right there. Some create pictures with sound. Well, we can kind of do that with ultrasound, can't we? But that's a sophisticated machine. It took intelligence to do. How about this other one? Others detect heat or navigate with electricity. Can any of you do that? No. Just evolve a little bit more, maybe. <laughs> These are incredibly complex mechanisms, but they just kind of shove, shove it off there. It evolved. It happened. Folks, that's nothing more than magic. If you're going to make a claim, you need to have something to back it up. Great claims require real evidence. Anybody remember this show? <laughs> Lost in Space. Who is the antagonist on it? Dr. Smith. If I had been in charge, he'd have been off that ship in the first five minutes with no spacesuit. Danger, danger. Right. Let's look at red flag words now. We've had fuzzy words. We've had magic words. I'm going to show you some red flag words. All, everybody, no real scientist, I believe, I think, truth, fundamentalist, intolerant. The first three words express some form of an absolute. All, everybody, no real scientist. I've had all these used against me in discussions. Everybody knows. What does that imply? They've talked to everybody, and they haven't, so it's a false claim. The next three express a personal idea. Why should I believe their personal idea? If they say, I believe, why should I believe what you believe? And the last two, name calling. You fundamentalist, intolerant, flat earther. <laughs> That's all that is. Let's try a few of these. These generally come down to what we call moral relativism. This is where these things come up. That's a whole other area the church has not addressed, nor have our Christian universities to a large extent. Moral relativism. There are no absolutes, no exact right or wrong. You know when our students get taught this? First grade. People should decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. Okay, let's look at that one. Well, if people should decide for themselves what is right and wrong, I just decided what you said is wrong. So why should I listen to you? Moral relativism is a self-defeating philosophy. Its statements contradict themselves. Here's the problem, though. We have a whole generation that's come up that have learned to live with contradictions. It doesn't bother them. These are some very hard people to talk to. You point out the contradiction, they don't care. What has the church done? Now, when I'm going to say church, I'm going to include the church, the Christian university, and Christians in general, because we're all part of church, Jesus' church. What have we done about it? Let me kind of give you an illustration. For decades, we've had people um, talking about evolution, actually for century now, evolution. We've had people talking about moral relativism quite a long time. We have people promoting abortion, people promoting same-sex marriage. Who should we blame for all that? Not the moral relativists, not the abortionists, not the evolutionists. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we've had decades to prepare for this, and we didn't do it. We have nobody but ourselves to blame for. We're in a serious war. And if we lose this war, we lose the country, folks. That's what's at stake. There's no time to be complaining anymore. No time to talk about all the things that are wrong. It is time to devise a plan of action, implement that plan of action, and start going forward. That's what we need to do. No one has the whole truth. Is that statement itself a true statement? It is. It's a true statement. It claims no one has the whole truth. That's a truth claim right there. So it defeats itself. A better way to say it, no one has the whole truth, including what I said. <laughs> All real scientists believe in evolution. Now, let's pick this one apart. What's the first thing you want to take apart here? All. all. Right. Have they talked all? What's the next thing? Reason. Right. Who, what gave them the right to define what a real scientist is? You know what the real scientist is? And I've had people use this. People who believe like them. That's their definition. <laughs> and then what's the last part? Believe in evolution, right. What do you mean by evolution? See, this is where they get this logical fallacy called equivocation. 
What do you mean by evolution? Uh, which side wants this next question? Which side wants the next question? Okay, you volunteer that side. Now, if they don't give me a correct answer, they all have to do push-ups. That's what you got them all in for. Yes. Now, this is an example of a loaded question. What do you mean by loaded question? You'll find out when they give an answer, especially if it's wrong. Here's your loaded question. Do you believe in evolution? Be careful before you answer. Do you believe in evolution? I hear some fuzziness there, perhaps. I want an answer. Yes. No, don't, don't. You get yourself in trouble here. <laughs> oh, we had a yes. Does everybody confirm that yes? Oh, you don't. You don't believe in evolution? You don't believe in evolution. Anybody want to confirm that answer? I tell you what, if you say yes, you're in trouble. If you say no, you're in trouble. You can't win. It's a loaded question. There's a hidden premise in there. And you must diffuse that hidden premise before you give an answer. What do you mean by evolution? If you're referring to what you commonly call microevolution, which I do not accept because it's not evolution, it's just genetic variability within kind because we observe that. Yes, I accept that. But if you're talking about macroevolution, one kind changing to another, I do not accept that because it's never been observed. You must pick out that hidden premise in there. These are tactics people are using. I've had people in the audience do things like that to me. So you have to be very careful. Why are Christians so intolerant of other views? Well, why are you so intolerant of my alleged intolerance? <laughs> See, that statement right there is an intolerant statement, isn't it? Remember I said, moral relativism is a self-defeating philosophy. It contradicts itself. I believe women should have the right to choose. Here's how I answer that. You know, I agree with you. Women should have the right to choose who they want to marry, where they want to live, and what job they want. But I don't think women or anybody else should have the right to murder another human being. And that takes the argument, where you have to take the argument, back to when does human life begin. And we know when it is. It's a genetic fact at conception. Everything else is just opinion, <coughs> emotionalism. Genetically, we have all 46 chromosomes, all the information we'll ever have for continued growth and development at conception. Nothing new is added. Oh, but what about implantation? Implantation doesn't add anything new, folks. It just gives you a better survivability rate. Because you don't implant, you're gone. So you take the argument. See, where I get this from is Paul in the Bible. Study how Paul answers things. He starts with something positive, and then he gets you. Jesus did a lot of the same. Look at the churches in Revelation. This is what I have to do good. Then this is what you do bad. So start with the positive, bring them in, and then give them what's wrong. It's a wonderful way to answer. Paul did it all the time. So I don't have to invent anything. It's in the Bible. Application. Let's take a look at the fossil record. I want to show you how to do the fossil record without having to get technical at all. Does the fossil record prove evolution is true? False. So we're done. <laughs> well, I got a little more time. Fossil record. I want to take you through just five pieces on this. A critical thinking question. Ooh. Deception in textbooks. Living fossils. When I joined Microsoft, I was 40 years old, and I was cold, older than dirt by my boss because I was older than 98% of the people in the company at 40 years old. They hired me as the token old person. <laughs> the Cambrian explosion in fossil graveyards. This is going to be your defense in the fossil record. Don't worry about all these big terms and this new fossil here and there. There's one other one we can use that's the killer to it all. We won't have time here unless you want to do it in the Q&A time. But it's the killer. When they bring up natural selection, they cannot win. I want to see, they can't win. So you have to invite me back to get that one. <laughs> And it has to be during the summertime, not winter. <laughs> natural selection. I was in a debate with two atheists recently, and they brought up natural selection. And I turned the whole thing around, because they started very angry and put me on the defense. But as soon as they said natural selection, the whole thing got turned around for a half hour. They were trying to define natural selection for me that allowed for evolution, and they couldn't do it. None of them come up with a valid definition for evolutionism. They, there were all kinds of things, like gazelles running. Some have longer legs, some have shorter legs. One with longer legs has escaped the lions. That was natural selection. I said, you know, we believe that as, creation, as creationists too, so you're telling me you're a creationist now. <laughs> oh, boy. 
I just kept taking their own words and using them. It was fun. Well, let's take a look. Critical thinking question. Okay, anybody volunteer? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, usually you get to a point nobody's even breathing. <laughs> so here's the critical thinking question. How much of the fossil was found and how much was drawn in by the artist? We need to train our youth. When they see pictures of fossils in the textbooks, think this way. It'll keep them from having doubts. Yep. How much of the fossil was found and how much was drawn in by the artist? Simple little things like that. Sometimes if they know their teacher well enough, they can even raise their hand and ask that question. Because there's an awful lot of artistic talent in these textbooks. Let's take an example. For instance, modern whales are the descendants of four-legged land animals. In other words, what the evolutionists teach, and this is what our children get, is a land mammal at some point in time decided to go back into the ocean for whatever reason. They have multiple different reasons. They're not sure because they weren't there. And decided to become a whale. You don't believe that. I'm going to prove it to you. There are the fossil pictures. That's right out of a textbook. Did that convince anybody? Better not, because that's most all artistic work there. Let me show you one here. Pachycetus. Pachycetus has been taught in our schools as the transition from mammal, land mammal, to whale. Can I show you what they found? Initially, all they found was the shaded portions of the skull. That's all that was found. And from that, they drew that picture on the front of Science Magazine there. That's not science. That's nonsense. Later, they found the rest of the bones, and up top there, you see what it actually looked like. That doesn't look like an aquatic creature at all. Now, the other picture is more of an artist, because we don't know what the fur looked like. We don't know how long it was, but we do know the shape based on the fossil bones we found. Complete misinterpretation of the fossil evidence. Here's another famous one. Lasted in the school system for over 40 years as the fact of human evolution. Darwin theory is proved true, New York Times, Piltdown Man. How much of the fossil evidence was found and how much was drawn by artists? Here's all that was found. And the teeth actually had file marks on to make them fit. The whole thing was a fraud. But it lasted for over 40 years in the schools as the fact of evolution. Okay, number one. Oops, number one. Number one, yes, yes. Number two. Has it been observed? Has it ever been observed? Number three. Are you making any assumptions? Number four. Observation and faith. And number five. How much was found and how much was drawn? Very good. See, we, we're coming along pretty good. Uh, some of you might get to leave tonight. <laughs> <laughs> any teachers here? Any teachers? <coughs> Nobody wants to volunteer for anything anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have what I think has become the best way to teach. Not bragging either. I think it's a fact, the best way to teach. And I use it all the time. It's called fear and intimidation. <laughs> and it works well. <coughs> okay. The Times. Piltdown man forgery. <laughs> that had to come out later. Elaborate hoax. Somebody had chemically stained the bones and made them look old. And it was part um, ape and part human bones. So now you're ready for your next quiz. We've had a pop quiz. Now we're going to get the real quiz. Ten questions. Passing is 100%. 99% is failing. What do you see on the left? What is that a fossil of? Turtle. That wasn't hard to recognize, was it? What does it look like? Looks like a living turtle on the right, doesn't it? Did that surprise anybody that turtles have always looked like turtles? <laughs> Everyone just have no clue where these turtles came from. They've always looked like turtles. What are those fossil imprints of? In other words, spiders have always looked like spiders, haven't they? Now, according to evolutionists, that is a fossil of a 400 million year old starfish. And what does it look like? A living starfish. That's a pretty dumb creature. 400 million years and never evolved. Never grew legs to get out of there. According to evolutionists, that's a fossil of a 50 million year old bat. And what does it look like? Modern bat. Fossil crabs have always looked like crabs. Oh, this is a trick question. What's a fossil shrimp look like? A cocktail. <laughs> they haven't changed at all, have they? What do fossil dragonflies look like? See, all these are easily identifiable, aren't they? 
How about fossil horseshoe crabs? No change. Fossil seahorses? No change. What are those? Frogs. Fossil frogs, no change. Where was the evolution there? You know what the explanation is? Some creatures are just so well adapted to their environment they don't need to change anymore. <laughs> that makes evolution, you can't falsify it. That invalidates the whole theory right there. Or not, I wouldn't even call it a theory, philosophy. Don't call evolution a theory. There's many different def definitions of theory, but a scientific theory must be observable and repeatable. So it's not a theory. No change in alligators in over 100 million years. No change, ooh, this one was great. They thought this one was extinct for 70 million years, the coelacanth fish. Extinct for 70 million years. They found some fossils. They said, these fish were growing legs and becoming amphibians, walking up on the land based on the fossil evidence. Then in the early 1900s, they found some coelacanths still living. Guess what they look like? Fish, no legs. The tuatar lizard, this is the one they like to put in dinosaur movies, dress it up a little bit, looks just like a big old giant creatures, but no change in 200 million years. Scorpions, no change in 360 million years. Now these years are based on the evolutionist timing, not real timing. Jellyfish, no change in over 500 million years. Now if evolution was true, if it was really true, should we find some amazing transitions? Can I show you what would be real good transitions? Has anybody seen the gator bird? <laughs> we haven't even found that one in Florida yet. Anybody found the bunny cat? How about the rhino melon in your garden? <laughs> bird dog. Now that one's not, who sang that song? Who? No. Everly Brothers, very good. Johnny is a joker. He's, see, I don't know what God does. He just stores stuff in your brain that comes out once in a while. He's a bird dog, yes. Sparrow boxer, that would keep the pesky salespeople away. <laughs> the improved polar bear. Look closely. <laughs> now this one we have actually found. We find him in churches. That's pretty biting. <laughs> Watch where you swim. We have our cat sharks. Or how about a face only a mother could love? Take that one home. Now these would make pretty good transitions, wouldn't they? But we don't find these. What we do, and we don't have anything better to do on computers, we make things up like this. You can find them all over the web. But interesting transitions. But here's my favorite one. We don't find the real transitions. They're drawn in by artists. But this is the first place I go when confronted with the fossil record. It's called go to the foundations. Isn't that what they're doing to us? Destroying our foundation? Let's go after the foundations. And there's your geologic column as seen in the uh, textbooks. But only go down to the bottom layers. The, if you can't remember the Cambrian, Precambrian names, just say bottom layers. Keep it simple. Why is that so important? Because what we find down there are fossil imprints of single cells, single cells. Then we find some very complex creatures like seashells, jellyfish, trilobites with tremendously complex eye mechanisms, even some kinds of fish. Well, why is that important? It's important because what we don't find, we don't find one single valid transition from a single cell to any one of these creatures. It's as if Every one of them was created after their kind, because that's exactly what the foundation for the fossil record shows. It completely annihilates the evolution model right there. No transitions. But I read the textbooks, and it goes on along and say all of these things just evolved. It doesn't mention there's no transitions. That is deception. But that's how evolution must work. Let's take an example here. Jonathan Sarfati. PhD in physical chemistry makes this statement. The Cambrian explosion is a mystery for evolutionists. John Aston, professor of biomedical sciences. The sudden appearance of fully formed species in the fossil record without apparent evolutionary ancestors and mutant intermediate species is a major problem for evolutionists. See, even they admit this in the textbooks. They just don't admit that there's no transitions. Here's a couple. 
in their book, most of the animal phyla that are represented in the fossil record first appear fully formed in the Cambrian. The fossil record is therefore of no help with respect to the origin of early and early diversification of the various animal phyla. We win down here, folks. No matter what they say up there, say, well, that's an interesting, I haven't heard of that fossil transition. But you know, when I go down to your bottom layer, the foundation for all of this, it's missing. And that means I have to accept what you're saying there ultimately by faith. They don't like the word faith, but that's what it comes down to, folks. If they can't show us the observable intertransitional creatures down there, it's a faith issue. Bring it back to the foundations. Then my second favorite one is fossil graveyards, where we find hundreds to sometimes thousands of creatures all buried together. Now, how do you become a fossil? Anybody know how you become a fossil? Well, eventually you will be dead. <coughs> you you got to be buried rapidly to keep the oxygen out and the scavengers out. Then you have the potential to become a fossil. Now, what we're going to find, what, we're going to, what we do find all over the world are these fossil graveyards. Let's take a look at some. Here's in Nebraska. 9,000 animals all buried together, and here's the kind of animals we found there. Do they all live in the same ecological zone? No. We got sea creatures and land animals and creatures that fly. Oh, the interesting thing about this is they're all buried in sediments laid down by water. Isn't that interesting? Let's keep that one in mind. Here's another one. 483 dinosaurs buried in a seven mile long area. And guess what? They're all buried in sediments laid down by water. Are you starting to draw a conclusion here already? That's a pretty big flood there. Does anybody remember a big flood? You weren't there, okay. But we have a record of it by the person who was there, the person who caused it. Utah, 12,000 bones belonging to 74 individual dinosaurs. And every one of these cases I'm showing you, they were buried in sediments laid down by water. And we find these all over the world. Alaska and Siberia, look at all those different kinds of creatures buried there. Dinosaur National Monument, <clears throat> Utah, 1,600 individual bones from 11 different species of dinosaurs. Grand Canyon, nautiloids, seashells. No, wait a minute. Seashells? The Grand Canyon's a mile above sea level, folks. How did they get there? And incidentally, none of them have been found with legs to walk there. <clears throat> How did they get a mile above sea level? I think there's only one conclusion we can start drawing. A worldwide flood. <clears throat> France. Wyoming, Green River Formation, there's some of the fossils we find there. <clears throat> Chile, they found a whale graveyard. 20 of these whales were com still completely intact. When you look at this, it just screams of a worldwide flood. So when we look at that challenge, does the fossil record prove evolution? Absolutely not. It verifies what the Bible teaches. Notice I did not say prove what the Bible teaches. Don't say that. Science doesn't prove the Bible. The Bible proves itself, folks. Science will support it, verify it. We don't even need to verify it. The Bible verifies itself, but it does support. See, true science will always agree with the Bible. Evolution counter goes against it. Incidentally, there's only two places we like to use proof anyway. We're very careful with using proof in science. There's only two places we use it, mathematics and alcohol. <coughs> so, two questions. Who's going to train the next generation, and what will they be trained to believe? Right now, it's not good. We're being out-educated, folks. The world is completely out-educating the church today. I want to show you what we're doing about it, what's happening in Boise. And we're also, we've already started going around the country. We offer one-day training classes. We have several here that win one day. And I know that's difficult to have me for a whole day, but let me tell you what you get for it. We have a basic creation training class for teens and above. So 13, we've had some 12-year-olds in there and above. That course, 8.30 to 5.30, we don't charge the church to come. We come to you, we don't charge the church. We pay our travel, we pay everything. We like to get help from the church because we don't want to go out of business but we charge the students. 
for adults is $45, for teens is $25. What do you get for that? The full day of training, 100 page manual, and we buy lunch for you. That's what you get for that. We don't make money off these things, folks. We have to rely on donors to break even. We are serious about getting people trained. We're not going to play patty cake with this anymore. We're very serious. When you're done this course, you're guaranteed. You're not going to have lack confidence in God's word. We cover a lot of stuff in there, and you're prepared. You're not ready to teach anything yet, but you're prepared, and you'll have that confidence in the Bible. We tear apart the four pillars of evolution, and we show you the days of creation, why there were real days, and we counter the things like the gap theory, why it's not true, can't be true, the day-age theory, oh, Genesis is just poetry. We counter all those. Because it's not hard to tell the difference between Hebrew poetry and Hebrew narrative. And Genesis is not written in poetry, folks. That's easy to tell. Any beginner in Hebrew would know that. Then we have a one-day advanced creation apologetics. Again, we come to you. That's for high school and above. We answer some tough questions there. Does God exist? Show me evidence he exists. And the big one, how can you call God good when he allows evil to continue? We go through all of those. You know that's the number one pe reason people will not accept Jesus Christ? And a lot of pastors can't even answer that question because they haven't been trained. Isn't that sad? We show you how to do that in there. I've used that in debates. And when, I'm, when that comes up, when I get in debates, I want to get it away from the science down to the presupposition level as fast as I can because that's where the real power is. Because there we get why they're believing what they believe. Why are they interpreting the same evidence I see in a different way? That's the power. Because we own that. Then we have a one-day Christian educators conference. That's the one we ran in, uh, way up there in Wisconsin this last Saturday. That's mostly for anybody that wants to teach or is thinking about teaching. In there we talk about what is Christian education, how to make it the most productive education in the world, and how to educate for nothing less than success. Then we show you 10 chapters on what you need to know in order to start teaching this. So we get you started. Then we have our very elite course. There's no other course in Christianity that I know of that even comes close to this. It's our five-day creation apologetic teacher scholars, and we have a, a, a survivor of that course in this class. <laughs> Next year, it's going to be August 12th through the 17th. It's going to be Ridgecrest, Ridgecrest Conference Center near Asheville, North Carolina. There's only two places in the country that meet our standards for this course. One is in North Carolina. The other one's in New Mexico. We have high standards because we want to treat you good because you're going to work. We only take 40 students from around the country, college age and above. We always have some PhD scientists there. We have theologians. We've had people with masters in apologetics. We have college students. We have all walks of life there. Now, what's this going to cost you? $570. Oh, Mike, that's way too much. No, it's not. Let me tell you what you're going to, get, what you're going to have to do, and then I'm going to tell you what you get for that. This is not a course we sit around round tables and say, what, what do you think about this? We don't do that stuff, folks. That's, that's not the Marines. This is Marine Corps Run. Matter of fact, we have a push-up box in the back of the room. <laughs> hey, we have the men's record, and we have the women's record. We even have the one-arm push-up record, and many people do visit that. Some volunteer to visit it, just to make sure they know how to do them. You're not going to just sit there and listen. You're going to be in class 8 to 10 hours each day, and you're going to be studying at night. This will be one of the most intense classes you've ever been in in your life. We're not doing fluff. You have to do two five-minute presentations. I didn't say five minute in one second. This year, one person went, I have a stopwatch there. They went three-tenths of a second over five minutes and took a point off their grade. We're serious. You have to do a three-minute defense presentation. We have a list of topics. You don't know which one you're going to get. We put you up in front. We give you the challenge. You have three minutes or less to give an organized, accurate response. Then you take a written final exam, closed book, closed note. You know what our success rate is in the five years we've been doing this? 100%. I don't tolerate failure in Christian education. We will work as a team for everyone's success because what we want to turn out here are top evangelists who are no longer afraid to go out there and evangelize and tell the gospel because they know how to answer the questions. We're serious about this. I wish the church was. And our Christian universities don't even know there's a war going on. You know, what the, you know how to handle that, folks? 
if the universities aren't going to do anything, if the church isn't going to do anything, let's just do it ourselves. And that's our attitude. There's a lot of hills out there. Let's go take them. $570. You get the five days of training. You get a 350-page manual, and we cover every page in there in those five days. Gives you an idea of what you're going to be doing. You get your room lodging, which is a nice hotel room type, private room, private bath. We don't do bunk beds. That's why we have a hard time finding places. And then you get three good meals a day for five days. You know, the, the room is over $400 by itself. You're only being charged $570. Our cost for each individual that attends is over $900. We have to supplement this. We have to raise $28,000 every year from our donors to break even on this course. We're serious. We don't want money to be the issue. We're willing to take the loss, but we can't take it that long. We need help on these things. We've already scheduled next year. We've signed the contract. We're going ahead with it. We've already got one person in California who said he's going to provide two full scholarships for youth pastors. Each one, $570 scholarship. He's putting that money up already. We need other people who can put up scholarships. This year we had a couple from Jamaica attend. I was over there a little over a year ago and taught over there. Met with their minister of finance for the entire country. Talked to him. I gave him one warning. Don't let the American educators into your country. They will destroy it. I hope he heeded that. But they sent two people over there. They were wonderful, a father and a daughter. The daughter was working on her PhD, and the father was extremely articulate. They couldn't wait to go back and start teaching. When you're done this course, you're ready to teach. You're ready to evangelize. Over half our people out there are now doing it. Some have started up creation groups and bringing multiple churches together. We've had women come out of here just doing great things. So this is a course. We have a couple of one-page brochures left. We just scheduled this uh, the other week. We haven't come out with our full four-page glossy brochure yet. That'll be out in a couple of weeks. But you can go to our website and see what it's all about because we have last year's information still up there. But next year, August 12th through the 17th, here's what we're doing next. We're not going to stand still, folks. I'm tired of hearing over 60% of our youth are leaving the church. And you should be tired of that, too. The churches don't seem to understand what it means. We're now building something. We're not building buildings, though. We're going to build warriors. We're developing two new major curriculums. And we believe it's going to change this next generation. Let me tell you what they are. First of all, what we're going to work with is the infrastructure that's already out there. It's called the Christian school teachers and the youth pastors. You may not think they're doing their jobs. Well, they haven't been trained. That's the problem. They haven't been trained. None of them have really been trained to handle these situations about evolution and moral relativism. Since they're already out there, why don't we train them? Let's do it. So we're developing a curriculum of two courses for Christian school teachers. I've been out polling Christian school teachers all over the country. And the common thing I get is I wish I knew how to answer my students' questions. They want to know how to answer these things. They can't teach it, and they can't answer the questions. We're, we're developing two three-and-a-half-day courses just for Christian school teachers and youth pastors. We will come to them to do these courses. And all our courses are certified for continuing education units. In other words, we're going to do what our Christian universities are not doing, what they're supposed to be doing. So we're going to train them how to make Christian education the best education in the world and how to have a biblical worldview and how to answer all these questions. So that's that target audience. Then we have our other curriculum, Big Book Worldview and Apologetics Curriculum. We're going to build master teachers and master apologists. We're going to build some of the best apologists anywhere. We're, going to, we're designing eight courses for that. Communication and teaching skills. You won't be teaching for us unless you pass that course right there. We don't take boring, dull, monotonous. That's the near and pardonable sin. You need to know how to engage an audience. We don't allow people to teach standing behind a podium, and we don't allow people to sit down and teach. You will be active and energetic to teach. Establishing a biblical worldview, Bible science and evolution, biblical apologetics, the Bible, why is it true, who is Jesus? You've got to cover those pieces in real apologetics. Moral issues, the sanctity of human life, gay marriage, how many races are there? Witnessing, we're going to talk about how do you witness to some of the major cults. 
Now, these are courses. We just don't come and listen. Most of these courses, you stand up there and practice this over and over again until you feel comfortable doing it. We only take a, a, maybe about eight to ten people per course because the practice time is going to be immense. This is not come and listen. This is James 1.22, be doers of the word. And the last one called the practicum. We're going to put you in some of the toughest situations to see how well you can survive. Try going to New York City or San Francisco and do street evangelism. See what happens. I don't know if any of you have done that. But you're going to get surrounded by six or eight people all screaming, hollering, asking you questions simultaneously. Can you handle that? That's what we're going to train you to do. We're going to put you in those kind of situations. When you're done, you're going to be a master apologist. That's what we're doing. This is what our university is supposed to be doing. See, our public schools, our Christian schools, go our Christian schools, methodology-wise, are no different than the public schools. They're really not. Because all they do is train for knowledge. How about application, being doers? I'll give you an illustration here on how we're doing on time. We got another couple minutes? Okay. Okay. Um, when I moved to Boise, a Christian school asked if I would be willing to teach a course for them, just one day a week. I said, okay, I'll do that. What's the course? They said, well, you write it, Mike. You can teach whatever course you want. And I said, okay, I'm going to teach one on creation apologetics. In the Christian school, some of the teachers did not believe in a six-day creation. They were a little concerned. Didn't bother me. You don't tell a Marine you can't do things. <laughs> So I wrote the course, and I wrote it so both junior high and senior hires could be in there. And they all walked into the first day, and I said, okay, we're only going to have one test this entire semester. Well, that's pretty scary, your whole grade by one test. They said, yes, just one test. And, oh, by the way, you can take it as many times as you want. You can take it today if you want. And my standards, A or B, I will not have a C. C is failing. I want high standards. Then I also said this to make it extra scary. It's verbal. The whole thing's verbal. I want doers, not people who can write answers on a piece of white paper. Nothing wrong with tests like that. They're good. And I said, you can take this test as many times as you want. Here's what your test is going to consist of. You're going to tell me the full context of the gospel. Most pastors can't do that. You see, I start the gospel, John 3.16, then John 3.17. What's John 3.17? God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world. The world through him might be saved. What does that word save mean? Why do we need to be saved? What do we need to be saved from? Where do we find that answer? Genesis. So we go to Genesis 1.1, so we find out who our God is. He's the creator of all things. That means since he created everything, he owns everything, he can set the standards for how we are to live. And that's very important. See, if you don't believe Genesis 1.1, you don't know who God is. Then I go into, he called his creation very good, perfect. How do you know it's perfect? I thought it said just very good. Well, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 says the works of God are perfect. Is creation the works of God? Yes. So his creation was perfect. It means no death, no decay, nothing that going on. And then we go on from there. And I go into the bad news. And when you get done the bad news, we're at a position we have absolutely no hope. Because God's standards, we've got to be perfect. No one's perfect. We're in trouble. We're doomed to eternal punishment forever and ever at that point. And then you turn the page, and we go to the good news. You see, this is when the good news gets exciting when you learn what the bad news is. See, the gospel doesn't start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as most people are teaching. It's not there. But when you get to the good news, the question I have to ask is, where does the good news start? Genesis 3.15. You see right there? If you miss that. Because in Genesis 3.15, we have the first promise of victory and a Savior. And you know where that promise is fulfilled? John 3.16. You see, you show the relationship between understanding the Old and New Testament, how they work together for the full context of the gospel. We even have things like this, uh, God's, the God's grace. You've got to put this in the gospel. Why? Now, I've had too many military people come to me and say, Mike, I was on the battlefield, and I don't believe God can forgive me for what I did. I've had a lot of military people come to me on that. They just can't believe God can forgive them. But in Corinthians, what a statement. I think it's 2 Corinthians 2.19 or 9.12. It's one of those in there. It's in the Bible. <laughs> it says, my grace is sufficient. Wow. God's grace is big enough to cover anything. 
I've done a lot of talks on the sanctity of human life, and I always have women coming up to me in tears because they've had an abortion. Don't think God can forgive them. What a verse to give them. His grace is sufficient. God can forgive you. I have a question. Have you asked him for that forgiveness yet? Because his grace will cover it. See, that's what we need, things like that in the gospel. So that's what we're doing. We have an electronic newsletter. Keep track of what we're doing. Sign up for that. And if all of you want to support us, you can put there. Here's a, one, take one of these cards with you. Think about this, supporting what we're trying to do. There's only three of us in our ministry. And my wife and I do not take a salary. Everything we get goes into the ministry. I paid a lot into Social Security. I'm taking it all back. It's my money. <laughs> so we live off Social Security. And we're doing just fine. But the ministry needs the finances to get these projects done. We're working with other creationists around the country, pulling people together to design these curriculum and building master teachers around the country. That's our website, creationtraining.org. We have over 80 30-minute videos for free out there. I've interviewed scientists, theologians, and three professional football players who are, who are Christians. They're all free. We have new five-minute videos. Here's the challenge. Here's the five-minute answer with graphics all the way through it. All my PowerPoint slides are up there for free. Download them. They're free. So we do need help. We're serious about this. We're not going to play patty cake anymore. We're going to move ahead. We know there's problems, but let's get to the solutions. That's where we stand. You have a local ministry here. Thank goodness you have a local ministry here that does this, because a lot of cities don't have much. You have an active ministry here that's doing things. Make sure you support them also. We're all working together, and we want to make a difference this next generation. Because whoever owns the education system will own this next generation, and right now we don't own it. But if you want to turn this around, we can do it. So keep that in mind. Okay, I'll stop there.